I'm going to my presentation, and today I'm going to talk about troubleshooting my performance problem. My name is Maciej Dobrański. Um, so, here's uh, what I'm going to cover today. Um, there are three major items. So, what is a performance problem actually? Um, areas where those problems can happen. And we'll discuss also um, identifying, identifying those problems in the running system. So a typical problem before this tends to be quite vague. So it's like um, it doesn't work or it's slow or well nobody really knows what. So we have we have to be able to deal with that. So we have to be able to verify what's going on. And it's also because people view performance problems very differently. Everyone has an opinion and everyone has a different perspective on what the performance problem is. For a developer, it will be simply that the database is slow, that's that. For a DBA, it could be also database utilization, database server utilization, um, or some other factors. So uh, solving a performance problem from a DBA perspective is usually uh, a multi-step process that starts by verifying, verifying and identifying the problem, then determining, determining its root cause, because without that we may not be able to solve that problem, we may merely kind of um, um, postponing it until it, come back, until it comes back at another time. And then eventually you have to implement the fix to that will solve the problem. So ARIAS and the multi the, the multi the multi step process looks more or less like that. So we start sort of at the bottom actually at the top, at the bottom from the lowest level and we go up trying to identify and um, and determine the cause. Um, yeah, so we start at the lowest level, the hardware, um, because hardware, high utilization, and in particular saturation, are um, will always have a big impact on the database performance. Um, why, why, what, are, what are the other reasons? Because um, yeah, hardware utilization is also has often a good indication of some existing problems. So it's not just that they cause problems, they're also a good indication that, that some problems exist in, in the system. So not even knowing what they are, we can already confirm that there is a problem. Problems that do not really, uh, hard, I mean, database prob performance problems that do not have any, any impact on the hardware utilization are typically application level problems, such as um, row level logs that are conflicting and causing queries to block each other, but this is due to the application design rather than to the, to the database problem, performance problem itself. Um, then we'll have software, software bottlenecks, um, inefficient architectures, logs, latches, mutexes, these all things cause can cause performance problems. For example, in a, that, that applies to both database and operating system. For example, in the operating, operating system level, there is a uh, write serialization on ext 3 the ext 4 file systems for write operations on indirect I.O. mode. So this is a software level uh, bottleneck that cannot be affected in performance. Uh, such bottlenecks also exist in my in MySQL, and this is why MySQL have been changing so much in the recent years. Of course, bug queries are um, the most frequent cause for performance problems. That's why we have to um, uh, we have to see what they are. We have to see what they do in order to determine uh, whether they whether 
this is the part of the set of coding problems. And of course there could be sorry. Of course there could be also other problems such as box configuration, hardware failures that will also create uh, um, a situation where the database response times would drop at some point. So um, the entire process is about measuring things, different things. So uh, we use monitoring for that wrapping system. Uh, we can use tools like here stuff that I'm going to cover uh, more in a, in a few moments. But basically we collect all the data and we analyze the data. <laughs> um, what is important is a something interval for our, our metrics. So the charger is better as usual, but also this depends on what we, what we need that these metrics for. So it's um, enough if you have a graphing system that collects metrics for like once every 10 seconds or every minute. But for troubleshooting, that's definitely too uh, too uh, high. You need uh, lowest lowest, lowest uh, resolution, uh, the, the best resolution possible, which means for troubleshooting, you should be aiming at one second interval for sampling when you're collecting statistics for analysis. And of course, it also depends on the metrics because you don't have to measure this capacity every second, but you will want to measure request latency every second. So there are a few terms that are being used in this presentation, such as resource, which is mostly hardware, such as CPU, storage, memory, network. There, there is uh, utilization, which, is basically, which defines how busy a resource is. Um, and also there's separation which determines uh, when a resource basically stops responding uh, in sort of like a timely manner or stops responding at all um, and starts re returning errors. So let's start with part of resources. Of course the most important one probably is the CPU that does all the work. Uh, there are three parameters that define uh, work that CPU does its utilization, which is um, how much work the CPU is actually doing. So for example, if it's busy uh, doing work for 0.7 seconds in a second, then it's busy 70% of the time. Of course, in multi-processor, multi-core systems, each processor, each core can have a different utilization, different load. So, um, um, so it, it's not it's not the same for every, every um, There are different modes of visualization. I mean, the visualization happens in different, mo in different modes. A user mode, which is just running user applications such as database, or system mode, uh, which is uh, executing sy system calls in the kernel or scheduling uh, tasks in the kernel. Uh, also, there are IO weights, uh, which is uh, waiting for disk operations, which is not actually something that CPU does. It's happening sort of in the background, but it's being measured by, uh, by the system. Then, of course, there is a run queue, which is a list of items, a list of tasks that wait for the CPU time. Uh, because CPU may receive more than, but we can only run one task at a time, it, may, it must be able to queue tasks that it cannot uh, handle at, at, a given, at, at a given moment. Uh, and then, in order to be able to run all these tasks in queue, there are context switches that allow those tasks to be uh, run sort of in parallel to uh, provide multitasking. Uh, context switching can be Voluntary, which means a task defines a, a, a task says that okay, I don't want to run it right now. Please give the CPU time to someone else, or um, or system decides that uh, the task should not be running anymore because it's using too much time, uh, and it should uh, make room for uh, for a new task to also run at the same time. So merging <coughs> CPU utilization happens with a simple tool like NPSAT, which breaks uh, utilization into per CPU per core statistics and also gives an average of across all the CPU cores. 
um, which shows which shows that uh, every CPU basically has, has a different utilization. Um, the different modes that I was talking about, uh, they are also shown in columns. So there is user time, kernel time, IO wait time, mm -hmm. idle time. So this defined is all the different categories of <laughs> CPU time uh, that are measured by the system. So the performance, for, for performance, you want user time to be as high as possible because it actually, it actually means that, that uh, versus other, other calls because it actually means that something is happening, uh, that is producing results. Whereas those other columns, IO wait time, kernel time, is mostly, is mostly overhead from the database performance from this point of view. Uh, we can also measure run QM. We do it with VM staff, for example. Uh, there are two columns, well, there's one from the first column that is, shows the run queue length uh, or uh, the number of runnable tasks on the CPU. Um, and um, the other column that I marked is showing block tasks. Block tasks, these are tasks that are waiting on, a, on this IO, for example, on IO, and an IO, an IO, but this IO in particular. They are not actually running, they are just waiting. They are not occupying the CPU itself, but they are the priority tasks. So as soon as they complete, they will be moved to, to the run queue and will uh, do, their, do their job. We can also measure context switches, also through VM stack. Uh, there is a column mark there which shows context switches. We want the context switches to be as uh, as little as possible because they're very expensive. They use a lot of CPU time. Uh, so uh, whenever we see context switches to go up, it suggests there could be some problems. We are losing, uh, we're losing performance. Uh, normally, it shouldn't be more than like a few, um, like one more than 100, 100,000 context switches per second isn't, isn't a lot. But if you start going into hundreds of thousands, that, that, that's probably a lot. So what are the symptoms of CPU saturation? So a moment where it stops responding uh, as fast as we possibly want. So long run queue, the longer the run queue, the, uh, the more uh, tasks need to wait for their CPU time. Uh, of course, saturation doesn't start at, at a random moment. It starts at the run queue time starts to be significantly longer than the number of available CPU cores in the system. Uh, and the saturation in this case occurs regardless of what the CPUs are actually doing. If they have to run, if we have two CPUs and 10 tasks to run, those tasks will have to wait, uh, to wait for, their, for the time which means uh, saturation occurs. Uh, and also average utilization is around 100%. They also starts causing saturation <coughs> for that. We actually also see run queue to be uh, high in order to uh, in order to, uh, for, for the saturation to occur because otherwise it, the CPU is just fully utilized. It's not saturated. So these are the examples. If you if you if you graph uh, if you graph uh, CPU utilization, no, sorry. Yeah, if you graph run queue the length, so the number of tasks that are running, these are uh, this, this show, this, this uh, mark five show saturation. So there are 16 cores in the system, and we show moments where the, there are a lot more tasks in the system than there are available CPU cores. So the system doesn't handle this, this, um, this task uh, very well at this point. There's also CPU utilization. In this case, it doesn't seem like um, like the CPU is saturated because there is a lot of room to grow. But what's interesting in this graph is system time, which is very high. It's almost as high as uh, user time. This probably means there is a lot of context switching, a lot of, a lot of uh, things that could be going wrong with the database, which could be suffering from some performance problems. <coughs> Thank you.
And this is a graph for complex switches. So it also shows very high level of complex switches, about 200,000 switches, which from also suggesting that there could be performance problems. Complex switches can occur as feds give up their time uh, because they don't have, they can't do their work. Um, which means that uh, um, the queries, rather than execute, they have to wait for something, and the database decides that they shouldn't be running and, and they can execute. That's another example. In this case, it shows a lot of wait time, which means the queries are waiting on IO a lot, almost as much as they are running, actually. So how are the response times wasted on IO always in half this step? In a half of the time that probably where it's running. Also pushed for, for storage. Storage also <laughs> certainly is not So this will be disk activity level uh, over a period of time, like one second, for example. There is a request write, which is reads or writes per second. There's a request for latency, so how long it takes to return some data. There is request to length, which is uh, basically, like if you if if there are too many requests, if, if requests have to wait to be executed, um, and if there are too many, the queue will be growing longer, and the wait will uh, wait will uh, occur. Um, the convention the system provides is service time and uh, average wait time. Average time wait time is actually the accurate number because it's something that is pulled directly from the. Uh, metrics that system has, service time is a calculated value and not for the real value. So uh, if you ever read IO statistics, you never trust service time. Measuring IO performance is done through IO stack. Uh, you can also use PTD stack, uh, which is probably available through a performance toolkit. Um, these numbers show request rates, queuing, response time, utilization and don't trust the service time. Uh, storage saturation is uh, more difficult to determine than the CPU utilization because um, it's you have to basically know what the storage, storage is capable of to be able to tell whether it's saturated or not. So you have to either know uh, the maximum throughput that, that your, your storage can do or the benchmark it. Um, we can also define your own parameters for that, but basically, it's uh, there isn't there isn't a fixed number that you can put in, put to it. Uh, of course, if utilization is close to 100 percent, it could mean that uh, there, there is some there, it, it's saturated. But on the right volumes, if you have multiple disks, the system doesn't know about it, so it will show 100 percent utilization whether one disk is fully used as well as uh, if, uh, sorry, if, if all this all these all these are fully used, or only one is maybe fully used, and or maybe uh, for this only used 25 percent of the time. So the system doesn't know it. So it will, it will show 100 percent for a lot of cases, a lot of. Um, but even if it's if the right is not really uh, under such load. A typical. Uh, using this utilization graph um, with um, request rates, reads and writes separately. IO latency also reads and writes separately. And the string strike, even if we correlate that with uh, between strike latency and reads, you can see that there is no correlation, which could indicate that the problem is actually originated. Uh, in the, for example, the right controller is doing something. The system isn't sending more requests, but the response time grows a lot. So it's not coming from the system. Uh, it's coming or from the database. It's coming from the inside of the storage problem. Also with memory, uh, utilization is how much is how much is used, how much is free. Uh, there is a tricky part here. Uh, there's a tricky part here. Um, Linux will show memory use as a whole memory, whereas some of that memory is just used for buffers and caches, which can be free. So it can be used by the database. And 
memory saturation occurs when the system swaps. But swapping, there are sometimes cases where the swapping occurs for different reasons than the actual utilization of, of memory. So there could be free memory, but the system starts swapping anyway. And example, there is a free memory. Memory that could be free, so actually the uh, uh, actually free memory is a sum of both, more or less, not just the free memory. Um, network can also uh, can also be saturated, uh, and also can cause uh, some performance problems. Like in this case, a gigabit maybe is being saturated by MySQL, which if you correlate with with a, with a uh, network uh, with uh, round trip times, you can see that the round trip time grows by a, uh, an order of magnitude when the network interface is being saturated. So this is affecting database performance and job applications as well. So we now move to database. Database provides information schema. MySQL provides a thing called my information <coughs> schema where you can find all kinds of stuff about database. Uh, runtime information, uh, insight into some uh, <coughs> database internals. Some of these things are only available through Perkona server. Some of the things are available in all database versions. So for example, you can see what, you, what is in the IMDB buffer pool by listing all the pages and, and doing uh, all kinds of queries against these tables. Uh, you can see what uh, role loads are being uh, held on, on any table. You can see who, what queries are actually waiting on role loads. You can just query the table in the information schema to get that information. Then, of course, you can, if, when, you, when you try to troubleshoot performance, you just go in and log, uh, log into the database and start looking at the process list to see what's running. Uh, which is a good graph of overview of the situation in the database. You can see the connected clients, you can see how long trades are running, which gives you the idea, maybe there's a query uh, affecting the performance that you could feel. Uh, you can also list uh, IMD transactions, which gives you transaction, transaction details, so how uh, long they run, how big they are, how much rows they log, uh, whether they uh, have any conflicts with other transactions. Uh, that you should resolve. This is available to show in United status uh, or to information schema that I showed on the previous slide. Uh, I, uh, the, the other interesting information <coughs> that show in the status uh, returns are semaphores. There is a section called semaphores which shows uh, internal low level logs. Uh, statistics and whether actually any log waves happen in, internally in IMDb. This is useful in you want, if, you to, if, you see, if you see a lot of context switches in the system, mm -hmm. this is where you can see if this could be possibly a problem. Because uh, with, uh, waiting on low level log, logs, log, we'll start with, uh, um, with uh, just waiting for a mutex or any other row level log, uh, low level log to be released. But eventually, I know we will give up and we'll just do a sleep. We will give up the threads uh, uh, to execute time back to the system. So this is where the always wait happens. And this is where, where the context switches happen, which reduces the, uh, which takes the CPU and reduces the performance. So a typical set of semaphore section doesn't look like that, but it could look like that. I can see a list of logs being held internally in China and DB. Some of them could be zero seconds, but it could still mean something if you're seeing a lot of that. It could possibly mean there is some kind of contention, uh, but we have to verify that uh, differently, not to, not to hear because this is just information, you cannot measure anything beyond that here. You can see the long way, the expensive way to have showing in IOM Mutex, which is the list of mutexes along with a list of the counters for each mutex to see how many times each mutex was, was uh, caused uh, an expensive sleep. 
And then uh, another thing that you can see, another interesting thing you can see in the uh, show of how you start this output is my thread activity, that my thread can sometimes affect uh, database performance to its internal background jobs, uh, like buffer uh, pool uh, page splashing or text printing. This can sometimes um, require uh, some global mutexes, from what mutexes are being able to use a lot in sign and Ruby. So this, this you, can, you can sometimes correlate performance problems to the main thread activity uh, doing something, doing some maintenance stuff. And this is more true for older rights for versions like 5.1, 5.5 and it is for newer ones. This is a, an example from 5.1 where there is a, uh, a lot of waiting on some mutexes for one second, which is a lot for a low level a low level log. And, but at the same time, database was doing checkpointing, which could explain that it was watching a uh, lot of data probably from the, from memory to this. Okay. <coughs> so there's performance schema, which is a new addition in MySQL 5.5, and this is great link to MySQL 5.6. It costs a lot sometimes, uh, up to 10, 20 percent of performance, but it gives you a great insight into what's going on inside that is inside database, uh, especially regarding to. Uh, regarding logs, low-level log stars, so IOs, uh, all kinds of ways that can happen inside inside IODB inside data inside the database. They also um, the performance team now also records history, so can you can see queries, you can correlate them with logs with weights, you can see what they do. Uh, quite complex in need for to use, but there is a PS helper, which is a package that you can download from the internet. Is a collection of views and procedures that make it easier. There are status variables that help, that, that help you determine uh, many performance metrics inside MySQL. You have to collect a decent number of samples to be able to see how this changes over time. You use MySQL Admin or PT stock for that, and then process uh, that output with PT and MX, MX to turn it into something you can use and analyze. And there are a lot of different things you should be doing it. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that's there. Um, so just to finish, okay. Um, so for software log, it uh, gives you insight into post execution stats uh, for each query. This is some Performance error contains uh, a good extension for that which I wrote a couple of years ago. Um, there are some few notes for that. It gives you a slow look that looks like this it has a lot of a lot of extra stuff, especially for IOB they can look at a lot of information. And you can use pretty query digest on your slow look to generate a nice looking report that tells you everything about the query's performance. Um, yeah. If, if somebody wants to hear that ending, I can speak about that outside. <laughs>